Hello and welcome to RCA Radio, a podcast covering the latest news and challenges in regulatory compliance and quality assurance facing the pharmaceutical, medical device, and biologics industries. I'm your host, Erica Porcelli. I'm the Vice President of Client Relations at Regulatory Compliance Associates. In this episode, we're covering everything you need to know about the FDA's proposed regulatory framework for artificial intelligence and machine learning-based software as a medical device. For today's episode, I'm joined by Lisa Michaels. Lisa serves as general counsel and regulatory affairs expert for RCA. Lisa, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Erica. Thank you so much. So there's been a lot of talk in the industry the last couple of years on artificial intelligence. What is the history behind and the purpose of the FDA's discussion paper and request for feedback on the proposed regulatory framework? This discussion paper, which has been issued by the FDA, is an output of a number of FDA initiatives that have been culminating over the course of the last several years. And they were initiated in an effort to keep pace with the ever-changing regulatory landscape. Of course, due to the constant emergence of new, novel, and cutting-edge medical devices and software technologies, the FDA has had this goal to establish more robust regulatory oversight for these evolving products to ensure patient safety. So to meet this objective, the FDA has put forth this discussion paper to gauge what the industry's feedback would be on this approach, and they've proposed this framework that they're referring to as a total product life cycle-based regulatory framework for the artificial intelligence and machine learning-based software devices. And where the history of this uh, proposed framework comes from is based on the organization um, known as the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, uh, also more... uh, more known as the IMDRF. And this is an organization that many uh, countries belong to. Uh, The FDA um, is one of the members of this harmonized group. And their guidance in terms of risk categorization, the principles that they've defined in terms of the benefit-risk methodology and the risk principles for software really lay the foundation for this framework, as well as the FDA's initiatives related to guidance documents issued on software modifications and their other efforts in the area of digital health initiatives. So this this position paper is posed to industry to solicit uh, feedback and comments on how these products should be regulated. So I think, you know, in the, the, the name of the proposed regulatory framework, right, we talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, and I'm going to make some assumptions that this could potentially cause some confusion in the industry uh, because they are somewhat similar. Could you give us maybe an overview of what artificial intelligence means? Sure. So artificial intelligence is, it essentially refers to products that incorporate certain software programs or algorithms that are able to analyze and continually adapt to new data. And that's why they're referred to as artificial intelligent, because the technology of the software and the algorithms um, is very intelligent. And the techniques and models that are used uh, in order for the software to be able to analyze and continually adapt to this new data it may be based on the, the, how the software is programmed in terms of its ability to do statistical data analysis, uh, relying on expert systems that uh, rely on uh, decision tree, uh, if-then statements, and other machine learning techniques. And essentially, the artificial intelligence algorithms are the software that learn from data, that's new data that's received, and then act on that data. So what is machine learning then? Because, you know, they they can be somewhat interchangeable, I suppose, but how would you, I guess, define that? So they are um, very similar. Obviously, they're connected. 
Machine learning is an artificial intelligence technique, and it's used to essentially d design and train the software algorithms to learn and act on that data. And there are um, certain types of machine learning techniques that the software developers use to create either locked algorithms or adaptive algorithms. And the algorithms themselves, um, when they're locked, they um, essentially uh, do not change. And the adaptive algorithms are those that can change over time. So do you see one or the other being more prevalent? Or does it really just depend on the circumstances? Um, it sort of depends on the circumstances of, you know, how, what the device is and how it's designed. I will um, talk about each, um, if, if that would be helpful. I can discuss the locked algorithm and then give you a little more background on the adaptive algorithm. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. So the locked algorithm um, is one that doesn't change each time an algorithm is used. And the manufacturer controls the intervals when the locked algorithms may be changed based on specific training data and process validation so that they can ensure that the system performs and functions as intended. Locked algorithms are those that provide the same result each time the same input is provided. And they apply a fixed function. So, you know, some of the um, examples or techniques are having a static lookup table, decision trees, or a complex classifier, and those are applied to a given set of inputs. Whereas an adaptive algorithm is one that does change over time based on new data or input. And these types of algorithms actually introduce a bit more risk because they're designed to evolve on their own based on receiving new data. And this, in the FDA's eyes, can raise some concerns about safety. The adaptive algorithms are able to learn from new user data presented to the algorithm through real, real world data. And because it's a continuing learning algorithm, it changes its behavior using a defined learning process. And the adaptive algorithm that, you know, when it changes over time for a given set of inputs, that output could actually be different before and after those changes are implemented. So these algorithm changes are typically implemented and validated through a very well-defined and in some cases, a fully automated process. And the purpose is to, you know, obviously aim at imp improving performance based on this analysis of the new or additional data. And that adaptation process that I've mentioned, there are essentially two steps. There, number one is the learning stage, and two is the updating stage. And the algorithm learns how to change its behavior from the addition of these new input types or by adding new cases to an already existing database. And then the second stage of the update occurs when the new version of the algorithm is deployed. So as a result, given the same set of inputs at a time, you know, A versus time B before and after the update, that algorithm may differ. So we have talked about artificial intelligence and machine learning, and I think it would be really important for us to understand the difference between that and compared to software as a medical device. Can you expand on that? Sure. So the artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies, again, have the real-time ability to adapt. They can optimize device performance based on this real-world feedback. And the intent, of course, is to continually, you know, improve the performance and ultimately enhance, you know, the, the, the patient safety, the patient care. So when artificial intelligence and machine learning based software is intended to treat, diagnose, cure, mitigate or prevent diseases or conditions, then they are designated, they're essentially also medical devices and they meet the definition of software as a medical device. Um, and this is a, a term that you know, comes both from the FDA perspective 
and the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. There's sort of a slight difference um, in terms of how um, it's defined, but essentially they're harmonized um, for the point of this this discussion uh, position paper. And the International Regula- Medical Device Regulator- Regulators Forum actually um, set up this risk-based framework for the software as a medical device, and it uses it as the foundation for determining the risk classification for uh, this type of, of software. And it um, goes from lowest to highest, class one, two, three, and four. So I think that's an interesting point you raise. In your opinion, how does artificial intelligence and machine learning fit within the FDA's current approach to pre-market review of new software and or modifications to existing software? So currently, the artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, technologies don't fit into the current regulatory framework for traditional software, whether that software is um, standalone software or uh, medical devices that um, the software may accompany the medical device. The new software devices and modifications that may be made to traditional software that uh, basically could affect the safety or effectiveness of the device typically require submitting a new 510K or if it's a PMA device, um, a a PMA supplement. Um, Anything that uh, impacts the safety or effectiveness of the device will require that. This new technology is, is very different because of the fact that the software itself, the algorithms, have the ability to adapt and change, it's happening real time. And so in terms of fitting into the current framework, it's sort of the open open situation where the current FDA guidance in terms of assessing whether or not a 510K or um, a a PMA uh, supplement may be necessary for a modification to the software it's slightly different. The, the FDA still recommends that their existing guidance, which is the, the guidance on deciding when to submit a 510K for a software change for an existing device, they also refer to it as the software modifications guidance document. But the artificial intelligence machine learning um, software modifications will actually require a very specifically tailored pre-market review and post-market monitoring process in order for uh, this to work. And the current process doesn't really afford that. Um, So that's why the FDA is proposing this new total product lifecycle approach so that they can ensure that effective safeguards are going to be established for this new novel technology. So what are some of the types of artificial intelligence and machine learning-based SAMD modifications? What, what should people be aware of? So this, of course, will be uh, specific to a manufacturer's type of device, its indications for use. You know, every um, piece of software is different, and how it's used in a device may be very different. So there's not really um, a cookie-cutter answer for the types of uh modifications that may be made to artificial intelligence or machine learning based software medical devices. But in general, the FDA has sort of categorized um, sort of three different general types of changes that they envision. And of course, this position paper uh, is put forth so that the FDA can garner additional feedback from industry as to whether there are any other types of modifications that are not mentioned or referenced that should be um, provided so that when the FDA eventually finalizes a draft version of a guidance document and provides more recommendations, they will feel like they're covering all of the um, most critical types of modifications that may be made. But typically... The types of changes would either involve um, changes to clinical and analytical performance, so performance-based changes, or uh, inputs that um, are used by the algorithm 
and their clinical association to obtain a particular output. Those may change or be altered. Or um, if the intended use of the software as a medical device is changed, then obviously um, that would be considered more of a significant modification. And so all of these three different types are essentially just the very broad categories that would fit into the types of changes that would be somewhat commensurate with how we view traditional software and how we look at modifications to traditional software that would potentially require you know, either doing a, a, a new regulatory submission or in some cases, if it's not affecting safety and effectiveness, um, the changes that could be handled internally uh, through what is known to industry as, as a letter to file. So a few minutes ago, you had spoken about the total product lifecycle approach. What are the primary elements of this approach? So this approach is intended to strike a balance between the iterative improvement capabilities of the AI ML software to ensure patient safety. So um, this approach requires that the ongoing algorithm changes are implemented according to a pre-specified performance objective criteria, and they must comply with predefined algorithm change control protocols. Um, of course, this process also requires uh, a robust validation process to be implemented, and this is to improve you know, performance, safety, and effectiveness of the uh, artificial intelligence machine learning software. And lastly, the inclusion of real-world monitoring. So at a really high level, the general principles behind this total product lifecycle approach is um, there's, it's, there's four sort of key areas. And the first is the expectation that the FDA assumes, as they do with any other medical device, uh, company that you are meeting um, quality system requirements, so 21 CFR Part 820, um, and they've basically um, developed this new terminology called good machine learning practices. And this is sort of still to be determined. It's it's yet to be um, you know outlined as to what this constitutes, but that's the whole point behind this position paper is to help develop uh, some of the specific requirements for what constitutes good machine learning practices. The second principle of this total product lifecycle approach is to have a initial pre-market assurance of safety and effectiveness. So this would be sort of commensurate with the current process where a manufacturer has to submit a 510K or some pre-market submission in order to, um, before commercialization. So it has to be cleared via 510K or a different regulatory pathway um, before the company can actually commercialize it. So in alignment with that methodology, this approach would also incorporate an initial pre-market review. Once it would be approved or cleared, again, depending on the regulatory pathway, then the modifications made to that initial clearance or approval for this type of software would then have to be assessed. And that's how um, this approach is outlining sort of the general themes on how modifications should be addressed and whether they constitute submitting um, new information to the FDA. So this approach, one way that the FDA um, is sort of proposing is to have a proposed plan, if you will, come from the manufacturer that once the device is, let's say, cleared or approved initially um, through this pre-market assurance of safety and effectiveness performed by the FDA, what is the proposed plan for the manufacturer to have sort of this established pre-specification uh, process and an algorithm change protocol? And so the FDA is suggesting at this early stage that this would be an optional way for 
the manufacturer to be able to explain to the FDA and get their you know, input guidance on whether or not that proposed process would be appropriate for their device in terms of how the FDA would um, basically use it, what they would use as a baseline in terms of assessing modifications after it goes through this initial pre-market assurance of, of uh, safety and effectiveness. And then lastly, the FDA expects that the manufacturers of these type of devices will have total transparency, um, not only to the FDA, but also to patients and users, and that they perform some type of real-world performance monitoring of these types of devices. However, at this early stage, a lot of this is very tentative. And, uh, you know, in order for this process to work effectively, it will take a lot of input from industry and experts to determine how this will actually work in the real world and what are the specific types of um, methodologies or processes or frameworks that the FDA would be willing to accept. And the problem with it is that a number of these devices are very different, of course, as you can imagine, because they maybe you know have a different indication for use. They're used in different parts of the body. Um, it's different technology. So there's not just a you know a one r- right answer for um, everyone to be um, you know following because all these devices are different. So this is all information that has to be uh, worked out as the FDA moves forward with this initiative to really come up with a a fair and consistent way of applying these general principles across the board for these types of devices. And again, using this risk-based framework uh, for the devices based on uh, the risk level that may be assigned. What are the regulatory implications of using this approach? So again, based on the, the risk level of the device, how the device is classified, um, you know, the current regulatory process requires a 510K or PMA, um, de novo in some cases, um, to be submitted uh, as the pre-market filing before they can receive their clearance or approval and start to commercialize it. So once a software uh, device such as as the ones we're talking about, uh, are cleared or approved, those modifications must also be assessed from a risk-based perspective to determine you know, whether a new filing is necessary. So in terms of the regulatory implications, it's not so easy as it um, may have been in the past, not that the process is easy, but in terms of being able to just use sort of consistent guidance and applying sort of the the defined um, methodology or flow charts that the FDA has put forth in, in some of its guidance for assessing the types of changes that you know you can make a decision if the, if it's this type of change a 510k is going to be required or it may be a change where it can be documented internally and, uh, you know, via the the letter to file process and a 510K would not be necessary. So with the, you know, what the regulatory implications of this new process are going to be is that there's going to have to be extremely heavy oversight by uh, medical device manufacturers that produce these types of products to make sure that they are constantly assessing these types of changes and being very transparent uh, with the FDA and and the patients or users, uh, of course, medical device companies have to um, you know constantly assess their devices already. So that's not necessarily a new hurdle, but because the process just doesn't specifically fit into the current process, the implications are such that this could take some time to smooth out all of the rough edges for these medical device companies that produce these types of products. So it could, in some sense, put them in somewhat of a a, a slight disadvantage as they 
uh, develop some of these technologies because the process is not well defined at this point in order to accommodate um, all of these different devices that incorporate this artificial intelligence or machine learning. So that is, I think, the biggest challenge for these types of devices. The good thing, of course, is that the FDA has recognized that you know devices are moving in this direction. Um, much of the digital health initiatives and uh, mobile medical um, app devices and things of that nature as we continue to expand um, the technologies of, of, of these devices and how they're used. Uh, it's great that the FDA is focusing on this effort, but the reality is that it will take some time before a really defined useful process is going to be put in place for some of these manufacturers. And in the meantime, we have to rely on existing FDA guidance documents, um, risk-based uh, methodologies, software validation um, you know, uh, methodologies and so forth that we currently use based on, on the risk level. But it will be very interesting to see how this evolves over time and how long it will take before we have a consistent and useful methodology for these, for these novel devices. Absolutely, I agree. Do you have a sense of, of what the FDA is expecting manufacturers to include for review in the initial pre-market assurance of safety and effectiveness? So that is still sort of to be determined. Um, the FDA is suggesting as part of the new framework that manufacturers would be given the option of submitting a, a plan for modifications during this initial pre-market review. Um, and this predetermined change control plan would include very specific details on the types of anticipated modifications that the manufacturer may have to the, to the software. Um, and what the FDA is referring to um, for these control plans is, is, is referred to as a, as a software as a medical device pre-specification or SPS. Um, again, the specific details of what that constitutes is not yet defined. Um, but the fact that the FDA in this position paper has said that this would be an option um, is very interesting because it, if this is the direction that the guidance needs to go in terms of, of gathering um, input from industry as to what makes sense for these um, pre-specification um, documents, it shouldn't be optional. It should be mandatory. So that's a very interesting point that I noted in the discussion paper, and we'll see how that shakes out. But in the, in the discussion paper, the FDA also talks about an algorithm change protocol that should be submitted in this initial pre-market review um, to, to assure safety and effectiveness. And this would essentially outline the manufacturer's specific methods so they can ensure that the, the risks of their anticipated types of modifications are going to be controlled appropriately. And in terms of sort of the elements or at least um, suggested elements of what needs to be in an algorithm change control protocol, the, the discussion paper actually includes as one of the exhibits a very high level um, section on sort of what they envision uh, the elements to be. But again, this, this is not even a, a draft um, guidance at this point. Um, so there's nothing in this discussion paper that is binding. Um, it's just sort of a reflection of what the FDA uh, currently suggests. And I think that this will definitely evolve um, as the FDA receives feedback from industry um, and provides input to some of their questions, which in fact are asking industry, what do you think um, are the appropriate elements for these pre-specification documents and the algorithm change protocols? So it will be very interesting to see um, all of the feedback that is put forth from 
industry and how the FDA takes that input and actually um, you know, prepares guidance based on that feedback. Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see how things unfold over the next several months in this area. Definitely. So what is the approach suggested for modifications after the initial review with an established uh, software pre-specification and algorithm change protocol? So again, right now, um, the FDA is, is there, the, the current process is to assess changes that um, could impact you know, the safety or effectiveness of the device. And this risk-based approach is what manufacturers should use when performing a risk assessment so that they can properly evaluate whether these risks are appropriately mitigated. And again, you know, this is going to be different across the board because based on the type of the, the modifications, it may require submitting a new um, submission or the changes may be minimal and they don't affect safety and effectiveness and they can be handled internally through a letter to file. So the approach right now um, is to sort of follow the current practice of using the FDA guidance um, to assess you know, changes, modifications based on this risk approach. And then you know, the, the pre-specification and the algorithm change control um, documents that have been suggested to be included in this initial review, um, as those become more refined, we'll have a better idea for how the FDA will focus its review um, on those changes. And essentially, you know, they will have to match. So again, the feedback is going to be critical um, coming from industry so that the FDA can prepare appropriate standards for industry to follow um, so that the, it, this review process is going to be consistent across the board for manufacturers of devices that may be very different, again, based on how the software is incorporated, how the devices use the you know, in, intended use of the device. And I think that's a pretty big challenge. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Do you have a sense of what the FDA's expectations for manufacturers to comply with transparency requirements and real-world performance monitoring? So this is still yet to be determined. Uh, The FDA essentially talks about uh, transparency, about the the function of the device and and the modifications of the, the medical device as a as, as a key aspect of their safety, so especially those that change over time. So these are some of the adaptive algorithms that we talked about earlier. Um, again, this is preliminary, but what the FDA alludes to is the transparency could potentially consist of providing updates or reports to the FDA. Um, and as the um, changes occur, obviously labeling changes may be necessary to describe those modifications and to be very transparent, not only with the FDA, but also with users or patients. So again, this is a, uh, a huge effort in order to keep transparency um, on the forefront and, and what transparency actually consists of, again, could be very different. Without the FDA either mandating specific types of reporting or um, labeling requirements. It's, it's difficult to determine at this early stage what those will be, but the, the real-world performance monitoring uh, is really going to require the, the manufacturers to establish a very robust process for you know, a set, monitoring these, the, this real-world performance of the devices, how the software is working, um, as it changes, you know, what are uh, the new, um, if there are new performance um, standards that are met, how the manufacturers incorporate this to determine, you know, the, the, the enhancements to the performance of the device. So again, this is sort of uh, very preliminary and the FDA is, is currently alluding to 
um, the involvement of manufacturers in either like an annual reporting process or in some of the pilot programs that the FDA has initiated um, just to sort of ensure um, this ongoing safety and effectiveness in the development of new um, devices of this type or, you know, modifications of this, this uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning software. So it's, it's again, very uh, open um, in terms of how this will actually um, come to uh, the FDA's expectations. It's, it's still to be determined. Well, I think in closing, and I, and I don't think I mentioned this at the beginning, but you know we're coming up on the deadline for submitting comments, which is June 3rd, 2019. Um, I know that RCA will be submitting feedback and comments, and we would certainly encourage all of our listeners to do the same. Lisa, I really want to thank you for taking the time to provide us with your insight. Um, it has been invaluable, and hopefully it has helped others understand the document um, in a little bit more detail. And to learn more about artificial intelligence and machine learning, please visit our website at www.rcainc.com. And thank you to our listeners for tuning into this episode of RCA Radio. And be sure to subscribe to be the first to know when we upload a new episode. And again, Lisa, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, Erica. Thank you. Thank you.